We're now going to begin by talking about the risks of using lithium in pregnancy. This data comes, at least in large part, from the New England Journal of Medicine in an article published by Paterno in 2017. What they looked at was overall cardiac malformations and, in particular, right ventricular outflow defects. This was a large retrospective cohort study which compared infant outcomes in three groups of pregnant women. Group number one were women who were on lithium during pregnancy. Group number two were women who were on lamotrigine during pregnancy. And group number three were unexposed women to either of these mood stabilizers. And what did they find? Well, when it came to absolute risks, the risk for lithium was 2.41 per 100 exposures versus 1.15 per 100 unexposed women. In other words, there was about a 1 to 2 addition of cases of overall cardiac malformations per 100 with lithium exposure compared to unexposure. When they looked at lamotrigine, there was no associated increased risk. Taking this down a bit and looking at right ventricular outflow defects, and we have to remember that Epstein's anomaly is a secondary outcome of right ventricular outflow defects. The absolute risk was for lithium 0.60 per 100 versus 0.18 per 100 in the unexposed population. Notice that the risk was dose-dependent. There were no right ventricular outflow defects with lithium doses of 600 milligrams or less. And in fact, in all of the 663 lithium-exposed babies in this study, there was not a single Epstein's anomaly. Importantly, lithium was not associated with any non-cardiac malformations. Take a look, if you will, at the next chart, which explains lithium absolute and relative risks of cardiac malformations. And what you can see is that at greater than 900 milligrams per day, there was a substantially increased risk of cardiac malformations. The risk increased threefold in doses above 900 milligrams per day. At under 900 milligrams per day, that risk was much less. So this is, illustrates Paterno's finding that the risk of cardiac malformations with prenatal lithium exposure was dose-dependent and became significant at greater than 900 milligrams per day. And so some would say you might consider the lowering the dose in the first trimester. But let's think about that. What are, in fact, the options? Well, we could stop lithium, but we know that if we do that, the risk is dramatically increased for bipolar decompensation, particularly in the first trimester, but throughout pregnancy. Another option is considering replacing lithium with lamotrigine. But remember, that's generally not as effective as lithium, especially for patients who have mania or mixed mania as part of their history. We could consider an atypical antipsychotic, but there's less data for bipolar disorder with atypical antipsychotics. And I will later on talk to you about the risks of both lamotrigine and antipsychotics in pregnancy. Remember, if you will, that more than 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, and it's always difficult to adjust lithium doses after a positive pregnancy test and yet before the critical window of heart development, which is four to eight weeks post-conception. So we always have to be aware of the early risk for relapse, as I've discussed. Now, remember, prenatal exposure to lithium increases the risk for cardiovascular anomalies, but does not increase the risk for neurodevelopmental anomalies or other anomalies.
How do we conclude and think about this? If you have to weigh the risk of lithium exposure against the risk associated with stopping lithium and not treating the disorder or treating with something that might be less effective or for which we have less data. So what are our key points? Prenatal exposure to lithium increases the risk for cardiovascular anomalies, but that risk should be weighed against the risk incurred to the bipolar mother and her offspring by discontinuing lithium. Prenatal exposure to lithium does not increase the risk for non-cardiac or neurodevelopmental disorders in exposed offspring. 